This is CBC Vancouver News. There was a gold minivan with the passenger door open and three girls screaming at the top of their lungs. He kidnapped, he kidnapped, he kidnapped. Port Moody police rescue a man and make arrests after they say someone was kidnapped on a busy street. You could be strong and you could still be taken away. Why are toxic drugs killing so many First Nations people in BC? The devastating numbers and what can be done to save more lives? And as Muslims in BC mark the end of the holy month, six prepare for one of the largest Vasaki parades outside India. Good evening, I'm Dan Burrard. Thanks for joining us. Port Moody police say they have arrested numerous people after someone was kidnapped on a busy road earlier this week. Police say they received multiple 911 calls after a man was reportedly pulled into a vehicle in the brewery district on Murray Street. The force called in help from Vancouver police, the Mounties, as well as conservation officers. And earlier today, they say they rescued a man in his 40s and arrested several other people in mission. One witness who posted what he saw online on Wednesday says he's shocked it was an actual abduction. I've tried Googling the story, trying to figure out what's been going on, if, if what I had seen actually happened. And it wasn't until tonight that I, I found out what actually happened. Um, I'm glad they were caught. It's crazy that it was in, in, in Vancouver. It's local. Um, it can happen anywhere. It just Port Moody doesn't seem like the spot where something like that could happen. Police say there is no ongoing threat to the public. Toxic drugs are killing First Nations people in B.C. almost six times more than the rest of the population. The data comes from the First Nations Health Authority in its 2022 toxic drug report. And as Angela Sterrett shows us, it indicates First Nations men are being killed at even higher rates. I was in so much shock. There's so much emotional pain. Last November, small boy lost his 23-year-old son, Darius, to toxic drug poisoning. He was Cree, a drummer and singer, and known for his generosity and kindness. My son had such a loving and caring spirit. He could be strong, and he could still could still be taken away. At 21, Darius slipped on some ice and broke his collarbone. And that's when everything changed for him. He, um, he had to get surgery and he ended up, you know, becoming dependent on um, painkillers. Men made up 63% of toxic drug deaths among First Nations people in 2022. 2022 was the worst year ever in terms of deaths. First Nations people represented 16.4% of toxic drug deaths in BC, despite making up only 3.3% of the province's population. This means First Nations people are dying from toxic drugs at nearly six times the rate of the general population. I think as a parent, I was in denial. I didn't want to see my son in that light. And... Um, his death, he showed me, you know, this is the ugly truth. Now, Small Boy wants to open up conversations about addiction among Indigenous men and about expressing emotions like grief instead of masking it with substances. That whole side of colonialism um, really influenced our society to be tough and to, you know, not really, you know, express your feelings and not to, geez, basically not to have needs. And colonialism through residential schools, the 60s scoop, and contemporary racism has created widespread trauma. As an Indigenous person and, and somebody that's down here, I can sort of recognize the 
the disconnection. Disconnection from culture, land and community, and also a serious lack of support. Livingstone started the Western Aboriginal Harm Reduction Society when he was a drug user in 2002. Today he wants to help others, but he says there just aren't enough resources. There's no access to, to housing and, and the supports that are out there just don't really, they're not enough to actually make, help people make changes in their life. He says the Safe Supply program needs to be expanded to meet diverse needs, along with more mental health support and ways for men to make connections. Angela Starrett, CBC News, Vancouver. A Vancouver councillor is pushing the city to lower the speed limit along Cornwall Avenue in Kitsilano to make it safer for people who live nearby. The move comes after two cars crashed and hit a five-year-old, sending her to hospital with critical injuries last year. She was standing on a sidewalk with her dad and siblings at the time. Her father, whose name we're not using to protect his child's identity, says their lives drastically changed afterward. Daughter, she's healing. She's recovering. She started to walk again. And she's going to rehab twice a week. And also, my two boys were next to me while that happened. And my daughter's twin brother, he affected most psychologically. So he had this anxiety still going on. He can't go to school full time anymore. He says speed is one thing, but argues left turns are the real concern in the area. Councillor Christine Boyle's pilot plan would lower the speed limit along Cornwall to 30 kilometres an hour for all vehicles. The first week of a coroner's inquest into the death of a man killed during a violent encounter with Vancouver police has wrapped up. Since Miles Gray died in 2015, none of the investigations have been conclusive, mostly because the officers involved refused to cooperate. But now they must testify publicly or risk being held in contempt. More now from Belle Puri. For the first time this week, Vancouver police officers spoke publicly about a fatal incident almost eight years ago. It started with a 911 call about a man causing a disturbance outside a southeast Vancouver home mere steps from the Burnaby border. Vancouver police emergency line. Hi there, there is a, um, we have a problem here. There is a guy uh, who uh, bothered my neighbor. She was just washing the outside and he took the water and spray on her. And he's just standing in front of the door and swearing. It ended with a violent use of force in a struggle between police officers, as many as nine of them, and a suspect. When it was over, Miles Gray was dead. His injury so severe an autopsy couldn't conclusively say what killed him. A coroner's inquest has so far heard from several of the officers first on the scene. The reliability of all the evidence that they're um, giving is questionable, but we're also hearing a lot of I don't knows, I don't recall. A common theme has been that a police union representative told the officers not to make handwritten notes after the incident. If true, that's disturbing and it's contrary to what the courts have said and it's contrary to what the, the appropriate statute is in British Columbia. Officers have testified Gray was extremely agitated, sweating profusely, hot to the touch and grunting. Yet his strength remained superhuman and he fought off officers like they were rag dolls. After the incident, the Independent Investigations Office of BC recommended some of the officers involved be charged with manslaughter, aggravated assault and assault causing bodily harm. Prosecutors declined to do so. In light of the evidence here, and from what the commu uh, scientific community is saying about what can lead to people's death, I think it's really important for Crown to reconsider approving the charges that were forwarded to them by the Independent Investigations Office. The inquest, which continues next week, won't make findings of legal responsibility, but only recommendations to prevent similar deaths in the future. Bell Puri, CBC News, Burnaby. A month has now passed since transit ground to a halt in the eastern Fraser Valley. Workers walked off the job there after talks broke down between the union and their employer, First Transit, over a new collective agreement. The union wants wage in increases that put workers on par with other transit employees in the region, who they say make around 32% more than them. First Transit's last offer was a 16% increase over five years. It's pretty clear to us that they're unwilling to give up any other profits. BC Transit's going to have to step in and do something. 
Um, BC Transit is the ones responsible for public transportation in the region. And as such, they need to make sure that they do something to get the buses rolling. In a statement, First Transit says it is willing to resume talks and participate in mediation or go through arbitration. The future of a beautiful and contentious piece of waterfront property on Bowen Island is somewhat more clear today. Metro Vancouver has approved the purchase of 97 hectares of land at Cape Roger Curtis to create a new regional park. The $40 million deal has been in the works since last August, but it's raised concerns about changes to that site that would allow people to camp there. Thousands of Muslims across the Lower Mainland joined to celebrate the holiday of Eid today. It marks the end of the month-long fast during Ramadan. And today, people in Surrey gathered for a Juma prayer. The CBC's Yasmin Gandam was there. Assalamu alaikum. Malaykum salam. My name's Yasmin, and I'm interested to know what we're doing here today. Today is Eid, the first day after Ramadan. We're actually very lucky in the Muslim community to have Eid on a Juma or a Friday prayer. Walk me through when you enter uh, the mosque here, what is the first thing that you would do? So a Muslim woman, usually if she does not come into the mosque in a state of purity, she would make wudu or the ritual act of cleansing. As you can see, there are three benches and each woman would come in, sit down with the hands, washing fronts and backs three times, arms up to the elbows, the right hand to the mouth three times. But there is a typical dua or a small prayer that is said when making wudu. I usually sit here with your hands cupped and towards your face, and then it's always touch the fingers and they come back down. You start with Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And then it goes left hand to chest, right hand over left. Okay. Do so you say Amin? Amin. And then it goes back up. Okay. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And to your knees. And then it's Subhana Rabil Allah. Back to standing. Okay. And then from there, you go down into what I like to call child's pose. Then at the end you go Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. For people who don't maybe understand, can you explain the significance of Eid? Eid, as I like to put it, is essentially Christmas for the Muslims. It's giving gifts and spending time with family as many would, as many would associate with Christmas. <laughs> What's the biggest message that you took out of uh, out of today? The main message is community for the all the, the people and the international brotherhood. You can say we can be a people understand what is Islam and what what we have a message. Our message is peace. What did you take away from that prayer today? When I see all the mu Muslim being here, like especially abroad, it gives me very much like joy because I'm from Bangladesh, uh, and like there, like there are so many. It's a Muslim country, and there are so many Muslim people. But here, it's a blessing, and we also live like five minutes away from home, so it's a very blessing to be a, you know much like so much close to our house. What would you say to people who are not part of the community about why uh, Eid is so important? It's a um, joy and it's a uh, moment for us to uh, like enjoy our like religion and then like uh, obviously leave, uh, like feeling the same vibe with all the Muslim around here. It's basically Christmas for us. The Easter, the uh, Vesaki, and the Eid all fell into the same month within a week's difference, right. which is great. You know, I mean, people get together, you, you know, make good friends and be nice to other people. It doesn't matter what community you belong to. Jasmine Gandam reporting tonight. To other news now, four of the Vancouver Aquarium's most popular African penguins are saying goodbye to BC. They're being moved to Edmonton next month. Hope. Lillooet, Steveston, and Salt Spring have been at the aquarium since 2012. Staff won't say where exactly the new bird, the bird's new home is, but 
A post on the aquarium's website notes they're joining a larger colony at an accredited facility. Trainers say they need to be moved there to improve the endangered species' odds of survival, as the Edmonton site will offer a chance for them to breed. Still with the animals, a mama goat at the Beacon Hill Children's Farm in Victoria adopted a baby after losing her newborn at birth. Moon went into labor and unfortunately she had a stillborn baby. Um, we don't know why, there was no reason sometimes. Um, and it was only one baby, so there wasn't a second one. And Moon was really sad after that one. It just it broke her heart that there wasn't a baby to, to welcome. But less than a day later, Moon's sister went into labor and had one baby goat so large, she didn't really notice the second one pop out. Loba says that's when they decided to act quickly and give the second kid to Moon. She says both mama and baby are very close and thriving, and the little ones play together all the time, naturally. And a library in West Vancouver went to the dogs today. Pause for Stories is a program that aims to help young people grow their reading confidence. Children between 7 and 10 years old got a chance to read to a certified and friendly therapy dog. It's run in partnership with the St. John's Ambulance Therapy Dog Program. Kids get to pick their favorite book to get tails wagging and chat with the patient pooch for up to 15 minutes. The Pause for Stories program runs at libraries across the Lower Mainland and v Vancouver Island. If you want to get involved, though, kids will need to register online to book a spot to read a book with spot. <laughs> Surrey is set to host one of the biggest Vasaki parades outside India this weekend. What makes this event so popular? That's after the break. Stick around. Thanks for watching our commercial free live stream on this Friday. Ryan Reynolds, as you know, is born and raised in Vancouver, beloved by fans worldwide for his work on the big screen. But he's beyond a movie star now. As Peter Armstrong tells us, Reynolds is busy building a business empire. It's about the future. It's a good time to be in the business of Ryan Reynolds. Canadians are terrible at self promotion. Well, some are, but this guy is not. I'm introducing Aviation American Gin. He sold his gin company for $825 million. He sold this mobile phone company for $1.7 billion. Are you on social media? And this week, Reynolds invested in this Canadian fintech company. It's time for a global tech company from Canada. No, we're, we're more of a payments company. Line. Hear the music. Reynolds is best known as a Hollywood actor in films like Deadpool. But this weekend, Reynolds aims to become a football legend in a small Welsh town called Wrexham. Reynolds and fellow actor Rob McElhenney bought this floundering club for $3 million. The club's been relegated to the lowly National League, the fifth tier of the English Football League system. But with a win tomorrow, the club will finally be promoted out of the basement and take one step closer to the upper echelons of the Premier League. The world of the Premier League to the fourth, fifth tier, or even where they are in the non-league, uh, is a world, is, is a massive gulf. This former player turned podcast host says getting promoted means more profile, more sponsorships. But the higher Wrexham climbs, the more the owners will be asked to spend. You, you need to be almost an oil state where you do really to be able to compete. Reynolds doesn't have pockets quite that deep. What he does have is a seemingly endless supply of charm and genuine connection to the brands he gets involved in. The links between sport and entertainment um, and the lines between them are very much blurred. And Reynolds intends on blurring them further. His name has been attached to nearly every conversation about who will buy the Ottawa Senators. It's very expensive. So, you know, yeah, I, need, not like I, need a, yeah. Yeah, I need a partner with, you know, really deep pockets. But that need cuts both ways. The deep pockets need a charming front man to get the deal done. And along the way, the charming front man's pockets are getting deeper too. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto.
If you're looking for something to do this weekend, Surrey will be the busy place. Tomorrow, it is set to host one of the biggest Vasaki parades outside India. People travel from all over to be a part of it. The CBC's Saurabh Sandhu asked organizers why that event is so popular. The tents are up and the buzz is strong. 128th Street is ready to come alive with Vasaki Parade's post-pandemic return. Uh, we're anticipating uh, larger crowds uh, just based on uh, the demographics, also the fact that it hasn't run in three years. Organizers are expecting between 700 to 750,000 people this year. Due to like a large influx of uh, international students from the Punjab area who will be very keen to participate, along with uh, families in general that have been missing out on the parade for three years, uh, and just the general awareness amongst the public and the, uh, and the mainstream community as well. Sikh historian Sharanjeet Kaur Sandra says the Sikh community has strong roots in this province's history. Well, the Sikh diaspora is one of the oldest diasporas out of the Indian subcontinent here in British Columbia and the lower mainland, including Vancouver, Surrey and Abbotsford. Sandra says Surrey has really become a cultural hub for the Sikh community. A lot of communities have now flowed into the city, whether it's, you know, for work, whether it's for other opportunities. They're flowing out of Vancouver into Surrey and ditto for Abbotsford, flowing out of Ab Abbotsford to Surrey. So there's been a lot of changes in the last three decades, I would say. And Singh says it's not just the locals planning to attend. We know there's like buses that run all the way from California to like uh, northern BC, from Alberta. But there's a significant amount that we can say of individuals that come from outside of not only the lower mainland, but outside of BC and Canada as well. The annual event started in 1998 and has grown in numbers ever since. More than 2,500 participants representing 20 community organizations are expected to be at the parade. Last Vasaki Day Parade was held in 2019 and over half a million people are estimated to have attended that event. Organizers say it's a reflection of the thriving Sikh diaspora and a testament to the multicultural values of Canada. Saurabh Sandhu, CBC News, Surrey. And there is a live shot of a mildly bustling Georgia Street. We started with the damp, ended with the gray on the south coast. But Kaljeet has spotted some sun for us, for us next week. Our province-wide forecast is next. Stick around. This is the new bug hotel, and it will be infested with insects soon enough. But in this case, they are welcomed here, and these little managers were getting everything set up for their new clientele. For me, bug is really important because we can't live without. So because the bee produces the honey and things like that, so I think it's good to, to thank stuff for the work and what he did for us. That's why last year these students at Edelard de Rosier wrote letters to the borough mayor. They wanted the borough to help them with a project to protect bees and the biodiversity of their neighborhood. I really hate bees. I don't like them. But when I did, when I did this project, like, it got more interesting and I can and I can know more about them. On top of the bug hotel, students asked for more flowers to be planted, less pesticides used on plants, and in May they don't want the grass to be cut so the bees can harvest pollen from dandelions. I am very happy to, to find these this young people with their, their involvement and commitment in the, our society and to have like in your, their heart uh, the, 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 the issue about the environment, the issue of biodiversity. This hotel is self-checking and out. Bees and other insects are welcome to sleep, nest and hang out here. Unfortunately, meals are not included. Well, to me, it's important for the bees, but for the whole planet, the ecosystem. Um, as we know, with the pollution and everything, it's not going so great. <laughs> um, so I think that every little thing we can do uh, to help, we should be doing. As the hotel is up and running, the children are hoping that the bees will come. And to attract them, they're playing music. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal.
Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. The Dotsa Documentary Film Festival returns May 4th to 14th. Enjoy thoughtful and engaging documentaries, special presentations, industry events and more. Get your tickets at doxafestival.ca and get inspired by the magic, power and beauty of choral singing as over 200 voices join and soar through the air at the Corleone's Van Man Summit Concert on May 13th. For tickets, visit corleone.org. The weather update is brought to you by Direct Buy Furnace installing the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Time for our BC wide weather forecast as we glide into the weekend, perhaps lurch, I'm not sure. Kaljeet Kale is here to tell us what more is gonna happen after we survived that week. Yes, there's going to be more rain this weekend, scattered showers, <laughs> Why not? sorry to say, but let's take a look okay. at our day. We have a quick little time lapse of what today looked like. Lots of cloud activity. We had some rain earlier this morning. Some fog got trapped by the water, and that's what made it a little humid as well today. We hit 100% humidity, then more rain came, and uh, more of that is on its way, and it's all because of a low-pressure system that arrives tomorrow afternoon uh, around 3 o'clock. So if you are going to Visaki, Try to go in the early morning hours, uh, and then it stays with us into Sunday overnight. So scattered showers throughout the weekend. Today's high, 10 degrees, just um, below average. Low wasn't too far off, like I said, 100% humidity for today. Rain scattered showers starting Saturday afternoon into Sunday. Then things will turn around, and I'll get to that in just a second. 40% chance of rain for Prince George tomorrow under cloudy skies and 11 degrees. 60% chance of rain for Victoria, 10 degrees there. Some sunshine for Kelowna and Cranbrook, but wet along the coast as well for Prince Rupert and a high of 9 degrees for tomorrow. So for the weekend, we're going to see about 20 millimeters of rain in Vancouver, more at higher elevations, down to 5 millimeters, so just a little bit on Sunday, and of course more at higher elevations. We're going to get the sun teasing us on Monday with a high of 12 degrees, and then a couple of days of clouds in between there before the sun comes back, and I think it's bringing the spring back with it, because look at this high for the end of next week, up to 20 one degrees in the valley, Dan. Could you just show us that again? Twi I know. Do you remember what this felt like? No. I, I don't know. No. I don't remember. Wow. Yes. Okay. We're not going to hold you to it, but it's it's something to look forward to. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, Kalji. You're welcome. I'm not sure I believe it yet. It's your late news for Friday. Thank you for joining us tonight and this week. For news anytime, check our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Your next local news is tomorrow morning at 6.30 on CBC Radio 1. And I will be your host on CBC News Network tomorrow afternoon. So please, if you can, join us then. Good night. Enjoy your weekend.